Good morning. We, we are just moments from officially getting started. It's a little different because we're really working on our live stream and making it good, but I want to give you a couple instructions before we start. Thank you, everybody, for cooperating. It's no fun to have to sit far away and not be able to hug and high fives and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Greenville Baptist Church. We're so happy to be able to gather in this place together to worship our God. Let's begin our service by standing and singing our praise to God.
it is great to be in the house of the Lord. It's also great to be worshiping in spirit with those who can't be in here but are watching and are participating in this live worship. I'm so thankful to be part of a church family, aren't you? Amen. 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 So obviously we can't go around and give hugs, but I am going to take just 30 seconds, a minute, where you are, turn and wave and greet, dating game, kiss, whatever you want to do, and just say hi to everybody, air hugs. Yeah. So you may be seated. We are very thankful to be able to be meeting again in person. Uh, We will be doing this. Lord willing, this will be the plan going forward until the uh, social distancing uh, is, restrictions are lifted there and and it feels safe and maybe vaccines, whatever it is. We don't know for sure, but we know that God has gifted us this morning with the ability to be together, and I thank him for that. Uh, If you are watching and you want to join us in person, we do have an RSVP system because of the fact that we have limited capacity here, but you can reach out to the office uh, today and you can let them know that you are interested and want to join us for in-person worship Sunday at 10 o'clock, or you can call the office, you can leave a voicemail as well that way. So there's not a whole lot of announcements, really. The main thing going on is what we're doing here this morning, um, but we did want to give praise to God for um, all of you who were generous and able to donate to the uh, Senior Snack Drive. They had a senior cookout at Lester High School, and our church part- participated by providing all kinds of uh, prepackaged snacks. And apparently at the graduation ceremony they had the next day, we got a little shout-out, got a little love from the principal for that. So we're really thankful that we could help, and I'm thankful to you as a church for helping with that senior snack drive. I'm going to go ahead and call up our elder, John Prest. He's going to lead us in a time of prayer, including, as he concludes, the Lord's Prayer. Whether you're watching at home or you're here and you have it on your bulletin, please do join us uh, in prayer at the conclusion of this as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. John? Good morning. Good morning. I want to read Psalm 145, and I'm going to do it quickly because of time. It says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, <clears throat> and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. <clears throat> on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who are falling and rise up, all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we... um, We're reminded here in this psalm that you are the same God, even now, uh, as we live in these crazy times um, with sickness um, and and racial strife and all manner of uh, things that are going on around us. You are the same God um, that we read about here, that you are merciful, that you are good, that you are holy. You care for us, and you will provide And we thank you, Lord. And I pray that we take comfort in knowing that this is the God that we serve 
still even now. And I pray, Lord, um, I, I know we're not taking offerings, but I pray as, as we have uh, given and, and continue to give, I pray that we give with this in mind, that you are a good God, an awesome God, and uh, you deserve uh, our praise even in giving. Uh, and I pray that you would uh, take those offerings and use them for your good and your glory. And now let's pray together as a church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand and continue to sing praises to our God.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song.
Good morning. morning. Somebody pinch me. Is this really happening? (laughs) Well, the scripture today is John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The word of the Lord. Well, many of you, it's the first time you've been in this room in quite a while. It looks a little different, huh? Does it look pretty good? That's a tease. If you're uh, watching online and you're able to, we want you to come in the coming weeks to be able to check it out. But it looks really nice in here. A lot of people have been working hard. There's still work to be done on campus. Still uh, looking forward to the storage building put up and the parking to be finished. The Clark Building is coming along uh, very nicely. When you came in, you hopefully noticed there's now a pathway that goes straight over there so that you don't have to walk or your kids don't have to walk through the parking lot. So that's a great plus as well. Again, good morning. It's great to be able to be here. I'm so glad to be able to preach God's word in person to people. That really helps me to communicate, I think, better to be able to do it face-to-face. And I think that benefits our online service as well, because when I'm feeling it more, I think it comes across even more on camera. So I'm excited about that. And I'm excited because we're starting a new series. I had a great time personally studying through Hebrews. First time I've dug into that book, really. Uh, read it many times, but the first time I began to wrestle with each chapter and verse and thinking what it meant, and I came away, I truly believe, with a more glorious picture of who Jesus Christ is, and so even just singing the song we just sang and thinking of the King of Heaven, He is a King, He is also one who is willing to be crucified, and that's our Savior, and He did it to save us. What an awesome God, what a great Messiah that we serve. Our new series is called Knowing God. Knowing God, and it's going to be a study of some of the characteristics or attributes of who God is, but the goal is not going to be simply to be able to rattle off a list of attributes about God. Oh, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. Those are great truths, but I hope at the end of this series, or actually even at the end of this message, what will happen, the goal, the aim, is that you will know God better and therefore love him more and delight in him more as you get to know him more find more joy in his presence more joy in contemplating who your savior and god is so we will be looking in the coming weeks at different attributes or characteristics of god and we'll be bouncing around in lots of different scriptures to see the picture that is painted here but one of the things that is very clear to me throughout the Bible, essentially from beginning to end, is that God created us to know him and to be known by him. See, God created us for that very purpose, that we might know him and be known by him. So the Bible gives us a picture of a personal God. We don't have a God who is the force, or we don't have a God that is a principle or an ideal or a philosophy. We have a living God who is a person, who has character, who has a nature, who communicates with us. And the purpose in creating us, the the overflow of his glory and his joy and his love poured out in creating us that we might live in relationship with him. That we might be in a relationship with the living God. Throughout the Old Testament, a very common phrase that you will hear, especially when The prophets or Moses are speaking about the covenant relationship God had with Israel. And then this language is carried over in the New Testament. You'll hear this phrase, 
I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's relational language. That's language that's speaking of a relationship between God and people. And because knowing God is the ultimate aim that we're going to have in our series here, because it's the ultimate aim that God has called us for, uh, we're going to spend today, before we actually begin next week getting into the attributes of God, we're going to spend today thinking about, talking about, learning from God's Word, what it means to know God. Now before we do that, let's go ahead and bow our heads and ask for the Holy Spirit's help as we interpret God's Word. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Bible because here we have that sure and unchanging truth that reveals to us who you are. And I pray this morning that as I teach from the scriptures and as I teach biblical truth, that you will take my words and they won't just be my words, but they will reflect your truth and you will take that and impress that upon our hearts and in our minds so that we're transformed into the likeness of your son. Do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. So this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You know, there is a difference between knowing about something and knowing something, someone, right? You can know about someone or you can know somebody. See, I know about Eldrick Woods. You might know him better as Tiger Woods. I know a lot, actually, about Tiger Woods. 82 wins, hopefully 83 after next weekend. 15 majors, hopefully 16 after next weekend. Uh, he lives in Jupiter, Florida. He's a professional golfer for the few of you who don't know who he is, Tiger Woods. But around the world, people know about him. He was actually born in Cypress, California, which is less than 10 miles from where I was born. He was born about four months before me. He was born in December of 1975. I was born in April of 1976. Uh, I know that he has two children. So I know a lot about Tiger Woods, but I don't know Tiger Woods. I don't know him. I've never had a conversation with him. I've never been in his presence. I've never hung out with him. I've never exchanged emails. We've never talked about the things that get us excited or about what what makes us afraid, what stresses us out. I've never seen how he interacts with his kids or what kind of dad he is. So I don't actually know Tiger Woods, even though I know a lot about him. And I think we, we understand this concept, and it's important because God doesn't want us to just know about him. God wants us to know him. He doesn't want us to be able to rattle off some facts about who he is and stop short of actually knowing him. Knowing him as we know our friends and our spouses. Knowing him in a personal way. God wants us to know him, not just know about him. But knowing God, knowing God is personal. See, knowing God takes a, a personal involvement. It involves our will. It involves our emotions. It involves our actions, and of course it involves our knowledge. It's a personal involvement to actually get to know somebody. Think about this in your own relationships. Maybe it's a best friend or maybe it's your spouse. To know them isn't simply a matter of reading their Facebook profile. In fact, if you go only by what they say on Facebook, you won't know them at all. You will know a somewhat fake image uh, of who they are. To know them, you have to be in relationship with them. You have to, it involves interacting with them, investing in them, sharing with them, listening to them, supporting them, and much, much more. It involves, in other words, the whole self. Knowing God is personal. It involves a personal connection. And the deeper the relationship, the more personal involvement it requires of you. Right? The deeper you want to go, the more that you are going to have to invest in that relationship. I have a whole range of friends, and they fall across a scale of how well and how deep that relationship, how well I know them and how deep that relationship is. And it may not change whether I love them, but it changes certainly how much I know them. So the deeper the relationship is, the more personal involvement it takes. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, 
God is spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And I think what Jesus was trying to reveal, at least in part of what he's trying to say here, is it takes ourselves, our deepest person, to truly worship God. The question on the table that he was answering is, well, where's the right place to worship? And he didn't stay there. He didn't get into the debate of whether it was in the temple in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim or whether Samaritans worshipped him. He said, because what really matters is that we open up ourselves and worship him from our heart. We worship in spirit and in truth. We'll say more about that in a a moment because we're going to have to actually know this God we're worshiping. But we have to recognize this is this idea that it's personal. To know God, to worship and love him, we must invest personally. Knowing God is not simply a matter of religious duty or religious works or religious worship uh, either or ritual. We can't get to know God just because we go through some steps that happen to be religious. We can't know God. uh, the, The actions themselves don't bring the kind of personal knowledge that God wants. And I'm talking any kind of religious work. So whether it's something might associate more with Uh, Catholicism, uh, praying a rosary, or going to confession, or taking the Eucharist, or maybe a more evangelistic, uh, evangelical type of religious work, doing a daily devotion, and uh, going to church, and making sure you tithe, you know, all those good things. Those are religious works, and they in themselves will not get you to know God better if you don't personally invest yourself. I had a friend here from church describe some of her family that she loves very much and some extended family members in her family and say they're, they're big on tradition and ritual, but no relationship. And I said, you nailed it. That's, that's it. God wants a relationship. He wants us to know him. And the rituals and the traditions aren't bad in themselves. I mean, you have to evaluate them scripturally, but what I mean is the idea of rituals and tradition, that's not a bad thing, and it might even help you, but it's no substitute for a relationship. I think of my own family. We have some traditions, as I'm sure all of your families do. We eat a Thanksgiving dinner together, right? And so we sit around, and it's a tradition. But that's not the same as the relationship. In fact, what matters is the relationship that's around the table. And the ritual only helps us in developing knowing God, but it's not a substitute. Because you can be at the table with your family, and it can be cold as ice. (laughs) And you can go through a religious ritual or worship and be completely distant, but you've gone through the motions. That's not what God is looking for. God wants us to worship him in spirit and truth. And actually, Jesus blasted the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, who were really good at following rules, And they unfortunately equated righteousness, being in a right standing with God, with making sure they followed the rules. But there was no heart. In fact, he called them whitewashed tombs. You know why? They look pretty. They're all white and cleaned up from the outside, and inside is death. He blasted them in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. He said, but woe to you, Pharisees. Woe. That's not something you want to hear from Jesus. (laughs) Woe to you. He says, woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb. What he's saying is you are good at following the rules. You tithe even to the the spices in your cabinet. You know, good for you. I'm so glad you're getting all that. And then he says, and you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done. You should follow the rules that God gives us. But he says, without neglecting the others, without neglecting the love of God. To me, that's him saying there needs to be a heart invested. It must be a personal relationship with God. And all of the rules and guidelines that God gives us for how to live our lives are not a substitute for a relationship with God. We need to know God, not just know about God. We need to know God, not just follow God's rules. So how do we know God, right? Isn't that the question? What's the, practically speaking, say you're, you're on board and you say, I'm ready. I want to invest personally. What do I do if I'm actually going to get to know God better? Now, listen, I'm not speaking out of both sides of my mouth because I'm about to tell you to do some of the things I said are not substitutes for knowing God. But they're essential parts of how you get to 
know God. So knowing God is more than knowing about God, but it's not less than knowing about God. Does that make sense? You, you have to actually know something about him to end up knowing him. The problem is when you stop short and you only know about, but you don't actually know him. So how do we get there? Well, we've got to know about God if we're going to know God. So we start with God's word, the word of God. If we want to know God, the word of God, the Bible, these 66 books that I'm holding in my hands are the source of certain truth, absolute, correct, true knowledge about God. So reading the Bible in and of itself doesn't cause you to know God because there are scholars who can read this book and they can describe it better than I can, and they don't know Jesus. They don't have a relationship with God, and they are not, to use our biblical and church words, they're not saved. They don't know God. So reading it alone doesn't do it. Yet without the Bible, we won't have the most fundamental knowledge we need to have about who God is to even be able to enter into a relationship with God. There are unchanging facts about God that come from God. See, the word of God is just that. It's God's word. He is telling us. He's the one communicating these truths, and they are essential to developing a deep personal knowledge of God. Guys, I want you to imagine with me. When I say guys, I mean guys, okay? Ladies, you can listen in too, but I'm talking to the guys here. I want you to imagine that you find this girl and you start dating her. But all of the dates you go on are like action dates where you're doing things. You're on a bike ride with them or you you go bowling or you catch a Red Sox game or maybe you go on a hike together or maybe you're really adventurous and you go parasailing or something like that. So every time you're together, you're doing something together and it's really busy and you think you're having a great time, right? This is awesome. You found something. You feel like you really connect because you have these fun things that you're doing. But imagine if every time she tried to begin to talk to you about something, maybe something important about who she was or her family or fears that she has or hopes that she has. Every time you go, oh, 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 let's move on. Aren't we ready to go to the batting cages? And you just kind of shut that down. I'm going to tell you, one of two things is going to happen. Either she's going to dump you because you don't actually care about her. But if for some reason she stays with you, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to realize, I don't even know who she is. And we do things together, but, but I don't actually know her because I've never listened to her. I've never heard her heart. And probably you'll discover it because someday she'll react to something and you'll be like, where did that come from? But if you had slowed down and listened, you would know her and you would understand her. Now God is speaking to us. He has given us his word. But if every time that he starts to speak to us, we just close the book and leave it there, and we get busy with something else, even something good. Like, well, okay, I don't have time to, to learn and listen to God because i got to go serve him somewhere. i got to go do something. You are going to fall short. And then when you finally hear or God does something in your life, you're not going to understand it. You're going to be like, I don't even understand you, God. Why are you doing this? And I don't know because I don't know you. So we have to listen to God. If you want to know someone, you have to listen to God and value what they say. Let me just say that again. If you want to know somebody, you have to listen to them and value what they say. When they reveal themselves, you have to pay attention. And God has revealed himself in the word of God. We cannot know him if we keep this book closed. There's no knowing God without knowing his word. So the first thing that that I want to commend to you, if you want to know your God, is you got to open up this book and start reading what he has said. I mean, can you imagine if you had a a friend who wrote you a bunch of letters, uh, you were distant from them, they wrote you a bunch of letters, and you never opened them, and you put them on your shelf, and then they come back after a couple of years, and they expect that you know what's been going on in their lives, and you're like, oh, you know, I was so busy. I didn't have 15 minutes to read your letter, so I'm sorry. That's what it would be like saying, well, God, I mean, I I really want to know you, and now I really need you. Something's happened in my life, but I don't even know you because I never opened this book. So we have to go to the Word of God. That's the first place to begin. Now, of course, uh, reading it alone isn't enough. God also invites us, calls us, demands of us that we pray. 
I would say prayer is relational. That's important. Prayer is relational. Prayer is vulnerable. I was talking with a friend of mine recently who was trying to work on a, a devotional book, and he had this cool idea of, of sort of like a shared devotional book, and you would read a scripture and write your prayers, and then you would share it with somebody else, and they would read the scripture and your prayers and then respond, and, and it's like a communal thing. And I thought, it's a great idea. The challenge is going to be, if prayer is real, it gets really vulnerable. Uh, and so I think it's certainly doable, and it, maybe it's even something when he finishes we could use here at our church in some ways. But the challenge is going to be opening up yourself in real prayer. Prayer is vulnerable, but that's essential to knowing God. You have to open up your heart. You have to be vulnerable. Now, the, the irony, of course, is he knows all about you. <laughs> he already knows all the things you think you're keeping secret from him or that, that you're afraid to actually verbalize because of how it might look in front of him. He already knows those things about you. So that's, of course, a little scary, but let me tell you, it's also good news because you will never shock God. You will never tell him something in prayer that he goes, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> so we have to open ourselves up because the very act of disclosing our heart to God draws us closer to him. I mean, that works in human relationships. We understand it's how God wired us. The more you open up to somebody, the closer you feel to them. And so the same is true with God. As we open our hearts to him, he draws us closer to him and opens up our hearts so that we know him at the core of our being. I want to read, I want to read to you Psalm 34, verses 4 through 8, because to me this is just one of many, many examples in the Psalms of somebody who knows God at the core of who they are, partly because they just so vulnerably open themselves up before God. So if you read the Psalms, and you read David's especially, I mean, they are just, they're him opening up his heart, whether he's afraid, whether he's angry, whether he's happy, he opens it all up to God, and you get a very clear sense that David knows God in a way that we desire and hope and wish we could know God at that level. And it's open to us. So Psalm 34, verses 4 through 8 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. See, that's prayer. He sought the Lord in prayer. And God answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And then I love this verse, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Do you hear the intimacy there, the joy that is in that kind of relationship? Do you want to know God like that? Well, then we need to pray to him from our hearts. We need God's word. We need to know who he is. We need to hear him speaking to us, and we need to speak to him. We need the word, and we need prayer. A third thing that we need if we want to know God is we need to obey God obedience is crucial to knowing God. We need to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will keep my command, commandments. Did you hear that? Love, relational. If we are in a relationship and you love me, you're going to follow the things that I tell you to do. You're going to follow the path that I lay out for you. You're going to be obedient, in other words, because there can be no intimacy with God without obedience. Because of the very nature of God. He is righteous, and he is good, and he is perfect. And when we sin, we know it creates a barrier. Now, there's a beauty in the cross. I'll say more about this in a few minutes. There's a beauty about the cross that our sins are forgiven. And they're forgiven forever. And when we put our faith in Jesus... They will never be held against us before the throne of God where we are kept out of heaven, out of his presence. But all of us who are Christians who have already embraced that, we know there's still a reality that when we're harboring it still in our hearts and our lives, when it remains unconfessed, it acts like a temporary wall that makes us feel distant from God. 
And as long as we're kind of hanging on to those sins and we've got some chambers of our heart that are locked up to God and we're not going to surrender those areas to him, as long as there is a lack of obedience, we will not feel the closeness that he has designed us for. If we want to experience the fullness of joy that can be found in knowing God and in knowing Jesus Christ, then we have to walk in obedience. We need to confess when we fail. We need to love him by obeying him. The more we obey God, it's this virtuous cycle. It feeds on itself like a feedback loop that the more, uh, the more that we obey God, the more we come to know God. And the more we know God, the more we obey him because you begin to see more and more of who he is and almost in this sort of silly sense, but like you don't want to disappoint him because you, you know him that much better. And so this cycle of the more you obey, the more you know, the more you know, the more you obey. This is crucial to going deeper in our knowledge of God. And when I say knowledge, again, I'm talking personal knowledge of God, not just head knowledge. Because I can testify that there were a few times in my life when I was going pretty deep in the Word of God, like learning new things about God, but I had some major areas of my life that I had not surrendered to Him. And there was a disconnect between the things I knew about God and the relationship I had with God. But as I surrender those things and walk in obedience, I get to know him better and better. So the word of God is crucial to knowing God. Prayer, where we open up our hearts, is crucial to knowing God. Walking in obedience is foundational to knowing God. And the fourth thing, the last one to share, is being in community with other believers, church. Being in church, being with other believers, that is a crucial part of knowing God. See, before I had kids, but after Sarah and I were married, we had a couple of years. We didn't wait too long to have kids, but we had almost two years, right? Or we had just over two years before we had kids. You better get that right. I do know the, the time frame. We had a lot, so you have more one-on-one -on -one time, right? I mean, when you don't have kids, you have a lot more time together. And we spent that time, we got to know each other, went on some vacations and different things. But an interesting and almost ironic thing happened. I feel like once we had kids, we actually got to know each other better. Even though we had less us time, right? We had less one-on-one -on -one time, but what, we, what, what happened is the dynamic of being in relationships with multiple people and seeing the interactions there and, and the way that it's just a different dynamic actually helped me see different sides of my life that I probably never would have seen if I wasn't in this little family unit instead of just together. Now, we still need us time. We need some times, and we're grateful for grandparents who take the kids and give us some us time. But to really know each other, I think, best, we're doing it in relationship or in community. See, because God's designed us that way. So it's not an accident that he's put us in church to discover and know God in a community of people. He's called us to actually know him better because I go to church with Pastor Ken or with Mitch or with Mary. I know God better as I see how they interact with God, as I see how we interact, and I'm refined because maybe I fail in a relationship here and I learn from it, or maybe we get it right and it's like things open up about who God is. Uh, and I'm not just talking, although I include Bible study together, but knowing each other and living together in community helps me know you better, but it helps me know God better. So I think God has made us such that we need alone time. We absolutely need me and God time. But you also need us time. The, the hermit does not know God better than the church member. We need to be in church, in community to know God. Uh, that almost seems counterintuitive, but then we see scriptures like 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Let me turn over there for a moment. 1 Peter, and what he's talking about here is how God has gifted us differently. And we use those gifts. And something happens when we use those gifts. Gifts that I don't have that you use, or gifts that I have that you don't have and I use. So verses 10 and 11, he says here, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Let me pause there before I read verse 11. 
varied grace, meaning God shows grace in lots of different ways. So I experience God's grace in one way through me and the way that uh, I relate to him and the relationship I have and even how I exercise my gifts. But you bring something to the table that I don't have because you have a spiritual gift and a relationship with God that when it's worked out, when you use it in this body, I see a different side and a different shade of who God is. I see his grace unfold. So community is absolutely church. A church family is absolutely crucial to fully knowing God. And so then he goes on to say, whoever speaks as one who speaks, or uh, one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So we see God's glory more when we do it together. That's just the bottom line. There's no escaping that. So to know God, we need to know his word. We need to pray and pray in such a way where we're opening up our hearts. We need to walk in obedience to God so that we are in a harmonious relationship with him, unfettered by uh, things that we're trying to hide from him or do against him. And then we need to do it in community as well. We need to be part of a church and a church family. And I, I just will say for a moment, absolutely meeting together is huge and very important. But you know church is bigger than just this, right? I'm talking about getting into each other's lives. And can you get into all 230 or 40 people here? No, but, you, but God will put you in a place where you can get into some if you will open yourself up to that. And it will change how well you know God. So we need to know God through community, through church as well. So knowing God is relational. Relational. Let me, let me wrap this up and bring it to a close. Jesus tells us it's not just a matter of head knowledge, that it is relational. But you know, he actually goes on to tell us something even greater. He says that knowing God is eternal life. Knowing God is eternal life. That's what we had read to us from John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life. This is Jesus we're quoting here the authority on life, because he is the giver of life. And he says, you want to know what eternal life is? He says, this is eternal life, that they, my followers, that Christians, believers, know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He says, to know God, to know Jesus Christ, is eternal life. To be in a life-giving relationship with the very source of life. That's what it means to know God. So again, that can't be only head knowledge. This is something that impacts our very soul. When we know God, we have eternal life. And this eternal life comes to us specifically through Jesus Christ. John chapter 17, a few verses later, verse 26 says, Jesus again uh, quoting Jesus, he said, I made known to them your name. He's, talking to, he's praying to God. He says, God, I made known to these my disciples. I made known to them your name. I revealed who you are. I have shown them. That's what he said earlier to him. It says, if you know me, you know the Father. I have shown the Father to them. I have made known to them their name, and I will continue to make it known. And then he says that, or in order that, so that the love with which you have loved me, Jesus says, may be in them, and I may be in them. In other words, if you want to know the depth of love, of the depth of the love of God, you have to see God in Jesus Christ. You have to receive that love through Jesus Christ and how he makes known God. That's where joy is. That's worth pursuing. All right, that's worth a, a five or six week sermon series <laughs> and far more. That is worth the life dedicated to knowing God more and more. Or as Jesus gave the example of a man who was walking in a field and he saw a treasure there and he buried the treasure. It wasn't his field, so he left the treasure there and he went and gathered up all of his savings, everything he owned, so he could buy that field and have that treasure. Are we willing to give up everything we know to put it all in second place or third place or fourth place or if it has no place in our life to get rid of it so that we might know God better. And what I commend to you, what I'm telling you and what I am telling myself and preaching to my own soul is that there is no cost too great to get to know God better. 
because that is eternal life and that is joy. So we're going to look at at least five. If I decide I I reserve the right to expand this, if uh, I get excited and find other attributes I want to talk about. But in the coming weeks, we're going to look at at least five different attributes of God. We're going to look at God's uniqueness. That's the best word I could come up with to, to recognize that there is only one of him. And he is unique. We're going to look at God's uniqueness. We're going to look at God's holiness. We're going to look at God's love, God's righteousness, and God's graciousness. And in learning about this, I pray that it sinks down into our hearts and moves from knowing about to knowing our God. Now, let me end with this. We cannot know God if we're not first in a relationship with God. A relationship begins with God when he calls us and we respond in repentance from our sins and faith or trust or obedience, faith in God because of what Jesus did on a cross 2,000 years ago. He paid for our sins so that the barrier can be broken down and we can be brought into relationship with him, but we have to receive that. He calls us. Maybe you're sitting here this morning or maybe you're watching online and you're sensing that call and you're saying, I feel like I want to know God better. God is tugging on my heart to know who he is and to experience eternal life, to know the God who made me and created me. Then what you are called to do is to respond to that call by repenting, turning away from everything else you've substituted for God, turning away from all the ways you've disobeyed what you know God calls you to do, and instead turning to God and embracing him by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you have not done that, today can be the first day you can really say, I know God. I want to know him more, but I know him now because I have come to him on his terms through Jesus Christ by repenting of my sins and embracing what Jesus did for you on the cross and embracing your Savior. I invite you, do that today and begin a journey with God. Now, the rest of you, probably most of you here already know God, but I hope you'll enjoy these next few weeks with me as we get to know him better. And may it come out in the way that we live, the way that we feel, the way we speak, the way we witness in every component of our lives. May knowing God radically transform us into his image. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for showing us yourself, for revealing to us who you are in your word, and for coming to us personally by your Holy Spirit, calling us to know you, changing our hearts so that we can respond with faith and trust. And I pray, Lord, right now, if there are people who are on the fence and they're hearing this and they sense that calling, that drawing from you, help them not resist it, but to obey it, to surrender in repentance and come to you in faith and to experience and know the full forgiveness of their sins and begin today to know what it means to know you and to have eternal life. You are such a good God. You created us to know you, and it breaks my heart that there are people who don't even want that. Lord, change that. Help us to hunger for you, and help us to share with the world that is dying without knowing you, that doesn't have eternal life. Help us to have a passion to share good news, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, do your work. Take these words. Help us take this knowledge by the power of your spirit, put it in our hearts so we are changed and so that we know you and then give us that joy that overflows. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as I give you a word of blessing. And then for those of you who are here when I'm done, I invite you to sit down so I can dismiss us in an orderly fashion. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ Grace which we see in a fullness when we are in a church together with other believers. And may the love of God the Father who loves you so much that he wants to know you and he wants you to be known by him. 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit who draws us into relationship with this living God be upon you all. God bless you. That's all. May peace be with you. I love you. If you're here, you may be seated. Thank you again for joining us online. God bless you.